On this edition of The Academics, our last look at one very strange year. Hello, I'm Paul Gates. Welcome to The Academics. On our last show of 2015, we thought we'd draw a bottom line on where we are on various issues. The Academics are Nancy Love of Appalachian State's Department of Government and Justice Studies and Michael Wade of our History Department. We're going to start with, with Donald Trump and some of the things that he has uh, caused comment about this week, but mostly um, the possibility that has now surfaced of an independent run. Um, what are we going to? What do we make of that? Or, or, or we could talk about the nomination of an independent run. Mike. Oh, I, I think it's probably too early to tell. Uh, uh, the party leadership is is not pleased, uh, and uh, so Donald Trump is, uh, uh, you know in fact threatened them with uh, uh, pulling out of the race with his portion of, uh, of uh, Republican support. Which is considerable. Uh, which is considerable and uh, uh, now we'll see how the, uh, you know, the, the party leaders respond. How can they respond, Nancy? What, what's, what's going to happen? What do, you, what do you think can come of this? Well, they can't control him. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's obvious. And um, <coughs> he continues to rise in the polls, and he's effectively playing on anxiety and anger of many Americans. The question is whether he's simply making a threat <coughs> to the Republican establishment. I mean, the. Republican Party doesn't control their nominee, right? It's the primary system, and it's the voters who are going to select the nominee for the party if we still have a democracy. <coughs> I'm willing to say today that we still do. And uh, given that 7 in 10 of GOP primary voters are saying that Trump is best equipped to respond to the terrorist threat, and that's an increasing concern among the American public, and I should say only Cruz is close, um, it's looking like he has the stain power to be nominated. Is it staying power or is it just that his attitudes and the news seem to dovetail uh, that gives him an extra extra boost? Or is it really the his ideas that are driving this? I, I don't I don't think that what Donald Trump talks about really rises to the level of serious uh, uh, ideas. I was going to say the same uh, thing. <clears throat> now, I do think that uh, it, it may well be that he's uh, uh, smart enough to uh, know what will play, uh, in which case he's, he's uh, to some extent, is pandering. Um, uh, and what's being lost in all of this uh, uproar uh, is... Uh, uh, it are issues that uh, bear directly on the uh, on the future well-being of the uh, of, of the country, um, and Trump's not solely to blame. He's just the loudest, brassiest uh, uh, of the candidates, uh, and probably not the most dangerous. Um, uh, but all of them, with the notable exception of, of Bernie Sanders, are content to uh, respond to Trump's lead. Um, uh, in the process, avoiding a really thorny, uh, important uh, uh, issues um, that uh, are, you know, are being raised by Bernie Sanders, uh, pretty much, um, uh, with perhaps uh, Hillary Clinton uh, chiming in every now and then. Well, and to go back to that recent New York Times CBS poll, four in ten of those GOP primary voters are placing strong leadership above honesty, empathy, experience, and electability in their choice of a candidate. So that, yeah, suggests that, sounds, that Trump that does. That sounds have, like the Germans in 1933. Well, that's the worry, uh, right? Um, the public is going to choose the candidate. Yeah, I mean that that has the word fascist has has surfaced in in recent uh, recent days. Um, uh, well, you know, are the, we overstating that, Mike? I don't I, I don't think so. Um, 
it, during the New Deal, uh, Americans like to say that it, 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 could, it can't happen here. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, it could. Uh, and uh, you know, if you look at the um, run up to the election of 1932, uh, the, uh, the demagogues out there who were drawing well uh, <clears throat> uh, were, were numerous. Um, and uh, uh, so, I, you know, I, I think it, uh, it could happen here. You know, the, the, uh, the German uh, psychoanalyst uh, Eric Fromm uh, uh, famously said uh, in a book called Escape from Freedom that given a choice between uh, uh, security and freedom, uh, humans would invariably opt for what they believe to be security. Well, of course, that brings to mind Ben Franklin and his, his saying that <coughs> people who would give up a little freedom for a little security deserve neither freedom nor security. And won't have them. And uh, so that's, that's where we find the public now, I guess, is uh, um, embracing or go, going against what, the, what these two, two thinkers have They've been telling us for a Meanwhile, long time. the issues that would go to real security going forward uh, uh, for uh, Americans now uh, and, and for their children and their children's children um, uh, are not getting much uh, uh, attention at all. Well, and in relation to that, I, I know many people were disappointed with <coughs> President Obama's speech. Um, and among the disappointments expressed was that he spent more time talking about um, the U.S. as a threat in the world than ISIS as a threat. And the argument was that he hadn't made us feel better about ourselves or our situation. But I want to suggest that maybe we need to feel worse for a while before we feel better. I mean, there are some pressing issues to confront. And um, I think Obama was calling us to account as a people and trying to remind us of who we are. Yeah. It is not, I, I, I didn't hear his speech. But it is not blaming the victim uh, at all to observe that globalization uh, is one of the drivers of religious extremism in traditional cultures. Um, uh, and global trade agreements have less to uh, do with free trade than with freeing corporations from public accountability. Uh, and they are then turned loose uh, in traditional uh, uh, societies um, uh, with uh, uh, you know, uh, predictable, uh, as it turns out, uh, uh, reactions. Um, and uh, then we, uh, uh, we, you know, we tend to judge uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the entire culture uh, by its extremists. Um, uh, while giving ourselves a pass right here uh, in, uh, uh, in the United States. Um, and uh, you know, we, ha we have our own extremists. Well, and we do, and that would <coughs> us nicely to, to topic number two, San Bernardino. Bernardino, is this a, uh, a game changer? Is this, uh, is this going to change our attitudes, our responses? Um, is this the, the thing we have thought had to happen before before there would be some intelligent response to the problem? We've thought that before too, though. I mean, I, you know, I would like this to be the tipping point and for it to prompt us to examine both domestic terrorism, which you're talking about, and also gun control. I'm not confident, though, given how the uh, GOP candidates in particular have been able to capitalize on it, and, and Trump is our primary case, that it's going to work that way. And in fact, support for a ban on assault weapons has been decreasing. Um, so the public is headed in the opposite direction. Uh, I, no, it's, it's not a game changer. Um, uh, it's, it's rather the reverse. It's, it's the same old. Uh, same old, uh, with America's favorite xenophobe uh, uh, setting the election uh, year agenda. Uh, we, we ought to consider immigration restriction uh, in, in this country, uh, but as a long-term response to this country's uh, ecological carrying capacity in a seriously overpopulated uh, uh, world. When it comes to dealing with uh, terrorism, targeting a religious group uh, is on the one hand too broad brushed. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it attempts to treat symptoms uh, rather than uh, causes. Um, uh, what's produced the uh, e extremism? 
Um, there, if, uh, if, if, there is, if there is a long-term solution, uh, it lies in, in the answer to that question, uh, not in saying that, well, no more Muslims, uh, as though that would somehow uh, uh, re resolve the problem. Um, <clears throat> uh, gun control, no change at all. Uh, after San Bernardino, uh, uh, the Senate voted down a, a bill to deny gun permits uh, to person on, persons on the Department of Homeland Security's no-fly list. Both North Carolina senators voted no. You know, and we've heard <clears throat> for years, we've heard the, the explanation for that attitude, I think, that you know, this is the nose of the camel under the tent and that this is the first step on the slippery slope. I mean, is that, is that what justifies a comment like that? Because what the president said about that not making sense makes perfect sense to me. That, that uh, why would we allow somebody who couldn't fly in a plane uh, to buy a, an assault weapon? Um, I, I, is that the, does that justify with this, this attitude? It, not in my book. Uh, in, in my estimation, uh, all that reasoning, uh, 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 sir, uh, the only purpose that reasoning serves is to uh, uh, avoid admitting that uh, uh, you're uh, so beholden to the NRA that you can't really do anything else. Because yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty clear, I think, that that attitude enables this terrorism, whether, whether it's domestic terrorism at, at uh, birth control clinics, clinics uh, or whether it's um, uh, people who've been radicalized to jihad um, overseas or, or on the internet, um, the, the problem is enabled equally. Uh, the, the, the connection, the logic of this is just inescapable. Uh, if you're on some sort of, if, uh, if a person is on some sort of watch list uh, for uh, uh, potential violent uh, activity against groups of, uh, of people, uh, it only makes sense uh, to uh, 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 not allow them to get guns. Let me say this quickly. The issue here is what does it mean to be tough, <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes being tough is being willing to confront the issues that are causing the problems, not having more guns in order to um, create the illusion of security. Well, topic number three, let's go to something completely different. Um, Abby Fisher is back at the Supreme Court with her affirmative action case uh, against the University of Texas. Um, and uh, this is the second time, the second trip to the Supreme Court <coughs> for her and her affirmative action claim. And um, we have seen some, some additional fallout, uh, not just over the, the legal issues, but maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, Justice Scalia and some of his his comments uh, in, in oral argument uh, in that, which are uh, an interesting place to, to uh, bring up those things. Um, what, uh, what do we make of this try number two at the Supreme Court? I'm happy to start. Um, I guess the issue in terms of the University of Texas Affirmative Action Plan is that it included two components, automatic admission for the top 10% of high school classes, and then race as a factor for the remainder of the entering class. And the use of race as a factor for admissions was um, previously adjudicated in the Michigan cases and also in the Bakke case. So there is precedent here. Um, and the big question seems to be whether or not this case is part of sort of a thousand cuts against affirmative action strategy, right? Gradually erode um, affirmative action plans. But in terms of Scalia's um, oral arguments, I mean, the inflammatory statement he made was that um, Minority students with weaker credentials might be, quote, better off at a less advanced school, a slower track school where they do well, unquote. Um, now, to her credit, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has noted that um, the UT plan 
right, um, currently relies on the racial segregation of Texas high schools in order to ensure the diversity, right, of their entering class if that second component is taken out, if they're no longer allowed to look at race as a factor for the remaining students who are not in the 10% of their high school class. So there's a problem uh, you, with the plan. You, you've just given me a thought. Let me, let me see if this, if this works. Uh, if if, uh, Ms. if uh, Justice Scalia's argument is that uh, possibly they would do better at a, uh, a, a less uh, commanded school, um, uh, is, is that not consistent with the uh, logic of the, uh, say, the North Carolina legislature, uh, which has in effect uh, created a system that sends more and more of uh, uh, North Carolina's uh, high school graduates uh, to community colleges rather than to uh, four-year universities? Well, I think Am the, I missing something? No, I don't think you are. I think you're also bringing up the issue that diversity involves more than race, um, <clears throat> and race involves more than black and white. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there are issues of class, right? Um, there are issues of gender as well as issues mm -hmm. of race. This is a white woman who's sure. bringing this case. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, it, it's probably worth noting that uh, uh, this, uh, the Bakke case, um, sort of split the difference, uh, and, mm -hmm. and that's why we have this uh, 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 this continuing uh, issue. Uh, they did order Mr. Bakke admitted uh, uh, to uh, a University of California Medical School on the grounds that the school used a quota for blacks and Hispanics, mm -hmm. which had prevented uh, his admission. Uh, the vote was five to four, and by an, uh, uh, by a similarly slim uh, uh, um, margin. Uh, the court in the same case approved a school's prerogative uh, to accord minority applicants special consideration in order to create a diverse student body. So it's, uh, uh, it's been hanging fire for 50 years mm -hmm. uh, now, 47 to be exact. All right, you know, when, back to Scalia's comment for a little bit, if we could. He, he's not making a legal argument there and that with that observation. He's wandered no, off into no. a sociological yeah. uh, soliloquy there, and uh, that is not not what the question before the court is. It, it's, it's, this is something else completely, completely different. Um, interesting to note, actually, that, that Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg are close friends, um, but even though they're ideological opposites. But, um, so what is this going to do to the, to the vote at the court, if anything? Let's, let's look at that for a second. My hunch is that they will probably wait, and uh, there have been calls for additional evidence. This case has been sent back once. Um, it was originally brought in 2013, I believe, right. um, and that it may be sent back again. Um, I don't expect much, uh, uh, and, and that's not a comment on the uh, uh, on the court. Uh, it, it, the The issue is uh, equality of opportunity that is equality before the law, uh, or equality of condition, uh, uh, that is results. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the issue that uh, has never been resolved and perhaps cannot be uh, uh, resolved. Um, uh, and that's the problem with uh, affirmative action as a centerpiece of civil rights reform uh, over the past half century. Uh, it's limited exploration of policies uh, less controversial in their values implications and perhaps uh, uh, susceptible to greater uh, uh, support across racial uh, lines. Um, uh, Abraham Maslow said it pretty well, uh, when the only tool you uh, uh, own is a hammer, uh, every problem begins to resemble a nail. Uh, and we're, we're still on that. We're still well, on the we, nail. You know, it's been almost 50 years since Bakke, and that, that is the question that remains unresolved. So I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that this court is going to get any closer to a resolution than, uh, than any of the others. Well, and the sociological argument has always been entangled with the legal arguments. That, that isn't new. I mean, you're presenting the equality of results, equality of opportunity case. Um, but there's also a question of, as we become a more diverse society, how do we educate all of our students to live effectively, contribute to that society if we have 
segregated educational systems. And uh, diversity enhances the education of all students, would be the argument. Sure. Uh, there's, I think there's an open question, I seriously do, uh, uh, as to uh, whether uh, our educational system is now uh, uh, educating uh, any students uh, 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 for the future. Well, and let's turn to our, our last topic, um, climate change and the uh, results or the, the continuing discussion at the, the Paris Conference. Um, seems like we might be making some substantial progress. Uh, the, the problem is getting more serious attention than it has in the past, perhaps. Um, is that a fair, fair observation, Nancy? I think it is getting more attention. I think that there is more buy-in on the part of the nations who have submitted plans and are trying to work out the final document, but verification of admissions is still an issue, and they've gotten an extension. They were supposed to have an agreement today. They will be continuing to meet into the weekend, and I think we don't know what they're going to be able to hammer out. Um, there are some nations that are already claiming that the attempts to find a compromise are undermining the strength of whatever the document will be. Is that is that so? I mean, that, that the compromise is always somewhere on the continuum. You're looking for, for that kind of agreement. Um, is that realistic, or do we just hold out for? You, you can't compromise the uh, CO2 content of the atmosphere. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there, there is no one magic answer, uh, and that that's part of the problem. And that these uh, uh, that these uh, that so many plans have been submitted, which was part of the idea, uh, is is a good thing, uh, because there aren't going to be global solutions to this global uh, problem. Uh, they're going to have to occur more or less locally, uh, and uh, and certainly nationally. Um, but the, the problem is, uh, the large problem, uh, uh, is that uh, globalization uh, and these global trade agreements uh, restrict the ability of uh, countries to arrive at their own solutions uh, to the problem of, uh, of, uh, of carbon emissions. Uh, we don't have time to go into the details of that, uh, but it is so, and the uh, number of specific examples is, uh, uh, is quite impressive and equally disturbing. So it's not a one-size-fits-all solution, and is that, no, and that is part uh, uh, of the problem? No, big problems don't necessarily have big answers. Uh, uh, they got to be big problems incrementally, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we would love to have a quick solution, uh, but the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, this one is not susceptible to that sort of uh, 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 quick global solution, whether it's technological or political or some combination of both. Uh, and uh, there's not much room for compromise uh, on the laws of physics uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the more general laws of, uh, of science. Um, yeah, I'm with you there. And the verification issue also involves longstanding um, mistrust um, between the more advanced nations and less developed countries. Here's one for you. I won't, uh, it, I'm sure it will cause some consternation, but why not? Uh, uh, the idea of not being able to breathe the air uh, or, or, or have, our, uh, uh, have our crops uh, uh, um, actually uh, not fail uh, uh, it should go that way, too. Um, we want to limit China's carbon emissions. Let's stop buying so many Chinese products. Well, and then also you've got the, the political issue that this, the, the climate change problems raise, in, in particularly thinking of China, where you know, the citizens really live with this every day, wearing masks and pollution yeah. is, is, uh, is yeah. just rampant on most days of, of the year. And that raises, a, that's a threat to the, to the political system. Uh, yes. is, is that yeah. going to, mm -hmm. yeah. will, will they respond to that? Uh, and, is, is that how you get China to play? My comment Play wasn't right. directed really at, at China in particular. It could have been India. Uh, uh, and the argument might well be that uh, it would be better for their citizens to have more breathable air. Um, 
So, so it's not simply a political, uh, you know, uh, a matter of political resentment of, uh, you know, against the, uh, the Chinese and their carbon emissions. No, no, it's not just the Chinese, surely. And we should take care of our own, too. Well, that's right. Uh, as, as, as one of the three main emitters, we, we've yeah. got our own, our own situation here. Well, and what has been engaged this time, though, to go back to your more mm -hmm. optimistic opening, is we are now finally talking about the connections between economic development, political legitimacy, and the climate crisis. And we're doing that globally. Mm -hmm. So, And that does require big changes, yes. starting with dismantling uh, 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 these global trade agreements. Yeah. And, and again, not a, not each, each country can't respond the same way. We've, we've got individual solutions because we have individual problems, or at least uh, a different con set of contributions to the problem, or a different degree of contribution to the problem. We have to, uh, have to take that into account, too. And that seems to be a hopeful thing. Are we, uh, are we, are we, we are getting to that point, Nancy? I think we are. Well, I hope so, and I, you know, I, I, it ought to be remembered that uh, globalization, the chief beneficiaries are, are, are global corporations, not countries, uh, and uh, certainly not the uh, citizens uh, of those countries. Um, uh, democracy is supposed to include uh, uh, everybody. I think we should try a little bit of it. Uh, yeah, and if a global civil society is going to emerge, climate change may be the issue. Yeah. Good. The alternative is not pretty. Okay. Thank you for joining us on The Academics. We'd like to hear from you. Please contact us with your questions and comments at watchapptv.com. Until next time, I'm Paul Gates.